Hey guys, welcome to Tech News Day. Yeah, so this is a, a bit awkward, but uh, one of the top tech stories of the past few days involves a company that we used to work at. Mm -hmm. On Friday, uh, seemingly out of the blue, the Machinima YouTube channel's library of thousands upon thousands of videos spanning an entire decade, or actually a little longer than that, it just disappeared. The channel is still there, but there is absolutely no content there anymore. This was, needless to say, pretty staggering news for a lot of people, whether they were the creators of hugely popular videos from Machinima's heyday or fans that look back on those videos fondly. Mm -hmm. uh, adding to the confusion is the fact that neither Machinima nor its owners have come out and really explained what the hell just happened or why. Well, we're in a unique position to provide some insight here, though, I mean, we, we have to tread a, a little bit lightly here. In any case, having most of our show, uh, the ETC show, previous show that we were on, deleted several months ago in a similar fashion, I guess we're uh, as close as you can get to it. Uh, at least on our end, they kept like six months worth of, video, worth of videos up, and those are all gone now. Yeah, they're gone now. Uh, we, we know the reason why this happened, and it's kind of boring, actually, while still being sad and infuriating. But before we get to that, if you weren't around when Machinima was at its peak, you might not have, have any idea what we're even talking about, so let's go back in time a bit. About 13 years ago, Machinima was a YouTube channel and website mainly focused around its namesake, Machinima, animated videos using video game engines. They had a small in-house staff producing content as well as a director's program where anyone could submit videos for a chance to get featured on Machinima's channel and get a little bit of scratch on the side. Yeah, so a couple of years later came the rise of multi-channel networks, or MCNs, of which Machinima was one of the first, if not the first, mm -hmm. arguable. Now, the way MCNs work is in exchange for a cut of uh, YouTube channel's revenue, the MCN provides better opportunities for advertisements and a little bit more protection when it comes to intellectual property. Basically, you pay an MCN to make you more money. In theory, yeah. In theory. At this point, Machinima had a great reputation on YouTube, so getting your video featured on Machinima it was an achievement, and yeah. a lot of people flocked to this new idea of actually partnering with Machinima as an MCM. Public opinion soon shifted quite dramatically, though, because it turned out Machinima was uh, essentially locking children into perpetuity contracts, meaning uh, when you signed Machinima's MCN contract, you were uh, technically agreeing to partner with them forever, mm -hmm. which is not legally enforceable, but uh, people did have to, like, actually take them to court to uh, yes to rule on this and uh, it left uh, a lot of uh, left a lot of bad bad grudges some yes. bad tastes in a lot of people's mouths in the meantime while that was happening machinima's in-house production it was still going quite strong it started strong and well it fizzled out towards the end but during all of this it was it was very strong it had shows like inside gaming uh, machinima respawn machinima realm and a little show that we worked on called etc these production teams made up just a small chunk of Machinima's staff, though, and at its peak, there were at least 100 employees in the building working in various departments. Anyways, like a lot of startups, the goal for Machinima from very early on was to build up enough value and hype that a big, established media company would come along and buy it up for millions of dollars and get all the original investors rich as hell. That's what happens with startups. Mm -hmm. That's Every the time. goal. If, you, if you're gonna make a media company, it is probably one of your goals to get bought out by one of the bigger media yeah. companies because it brings a lot of stuff to the table. First of all, money, but second of all, distribution, access, yeah. stuff like that. That ended up not happening though, at least not at the time that they were hoping for. In 2014, Disney bought up Maker Studios for at least a half a billion dollars, but Machinima was unable to get Warner Brothers interested in the same kind of deal at the time, until two and a half years later, when the hype had very much died down and Warner could buy up Machinima for what is estimated online in various outlets at around a hundred million dollars. So not the, not the cool half a bill they were looking for. By but the way, not they, too they, shabby. Either. Not even internally they ever said what, what it was sold for. You know? no. So we have no insider information of the business dealings of this company no. at all. We just kept our heads low, took our paycheck, and made some of some of the best content that is now erased from history we've yeah. ever made. All I know about how much they were bought for is that uh, uh, many of the early employees who deluded themselves into believing that their company stock was super valuable were sadly disappointed. Hmm. But anyway, by that point, Machinima's reputation as an MCN was quite negative, and most of the in-house on-camera talent that Machinima had at its peak had moved on to greener pastures like Rooster Teeth. 
Uh, we stuck around because honestly, the pay was all right. We were building a career and there was never a good enough reason to risk going out on our own, at least not for a couple of years. Here's the thing, we were getting uh, a paycheck to come in and make stupid, silly videos yeah. on a daily basis and work with some of our best friends. So and it's we, like- we started it. we started at the hosting thing in a different sort of phase than a yeah. lot of the early guys who had been very just sort of worn down by uh, a, what was essentially a different company. Like mm -hmm. the, the weirdest thing about Machinima that I wish more people understood is that over the course of like a five year period, it was like how they say your body, like all the cells in your body, like are completely regenerated. Yeah. It, like there was maybe one or two people from that first period that were still there like five years later. Yeah. It was entirely different But stuff. like I said, at, at its peak, it was the most incredible creative environment, very light touch from yeah. a lot of executives, do whatever the hell you want, experiment with things. Uh, but like with any company, when you have executives and investors and all that stuff, like sometimes things get lost along the way. Sometimes people leave to greener pastures and you know, we made we made do with what we had, and it was a we had yeah. a blast while we were there. I was so. having a good time, and I was yeah. like, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna stay here as long as I can. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can't believe we're getting paid to talk shit about movies. Yeah. Uh, anyways, at the beginning of 2018, uh, we were very, very kindly notified that despite our show actually being profitable, it just didn't really fit in at all with what the company was trying to do at the time. We were given a very, very nice runway uh, to get our shit together and make a clean exit. Uh, it did come as a bit of a surprise, but at that point, our relationship with Machinima was definitely one of those relationships where despite everything being stagnant and sometimes sometimes a bit hostile, neither party wants to be the one to break up with the other because overall, it was mutually beneficial. Yeah, it was a good match. Like, yeah, and they gave us that set in the last year. Uh, yeah, we were doing party time. It was uh, we had editors. It was uh, it was good. And like, and honestly, like at the end there, like end of 2017, early 2018, like. I was the most happy with the people in charge of making decisions there. Yeah. And like the relationship with the company was the least hostile it had been. Yeah, it in seemed a very like they had time. learned from internal mistakes. Yeah, we were treated years. like well. Or just left alone, yeah, which is that, being treated it, well. It, <laughs> yeah. Essentially, yeah. yeah. So anyway, we spent the first half of 2018 simultaneously carrying on as usual while also very clumsily trying to figure out how to start a business or if that would even work. Mm -hmm. uh, by June though, we were out on our own making videos on this channel and things are going well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks uh, for the Patreon support. We yeah. literally wouldn't be doing this show right now if that didn't happen. We would have probably gone and got other jobs because- I'd be working at the bank. Because yeah, ad rev, not great. Yeah, so over at Machinima though, uh, one of the main reasons that ETC didn't really fit into the content strategy going forward was the fact that despite being recently purchased by Warner, another, much bigger acquisition was now taking place. AT&T was buying Time Warner for $85 billion, and there was about to be a ton of redundancies in that new Frankensteinish corporate structure. Mm -hmm. uh, going into the deal, Time Warner, of course, owned various movie studios and TV channels, as well as DC Entertainment, but also digital media properties like Machinima, Super Deluxe, and the Filmstruck streaming service. AT&T, for its part, already owned a bunch of digital media companies. They had a controlling stake in Otter Media, which has since become full ownership. And contained in Otter Media were companies like Full Screen, Crunchyroll, VRV, and Rooster Teeth. So late last year, AT&T did some spring cleaning <laughs> in the fall mm -hmm. and uh, axed both Super Deluxe and Filmstruck. And that upset a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, next up, Full Screen and Machinima, they're both MCNs. So it's not really a surprise that recently all of Machinima's MCN partners were transferred over to Full Screen killing Machinima as an MCN. This kills the MCN. Why would you have two separate things? And and meanwhile, on the meta stage of that, MCNs as a whole are just not nearly as relevant as they were well, five years ago. Well, the whole thing ago. was, back then, you, you couldn't really monetize videos yeah. unless you are part of an MCN. And then YouTube released its own kind of partner program. And it's like, you didn't really need it as much if they weren't providing you with a service that was worth it. Yeah. And almost every MCN wasn't unless you were a big player I mean, within that MCN. Yeah, at its peak, I think Machinima had like 35,000 MCN clients. And I believe like Maker and Fullscreen had in that same range as well, yeah. which... Same thing with the Defy Media. Yeah, and they like, actually got... So here's one good thing. 
at least there was a transfer uh, or, or what is seemingly, I, I don't know, I'm not in the process of this, but a, a clean transfer from one to the other where you're yeah. still represented and, and fine. Whereas when Defy went down, it seemed as though they hung all their partners out to dry and yeah, no, they didn't even pay them. Yeah, there's uh, that, yeah, Defy really fucked people. Allegedly. Anyways, meanwhile, uh, the Machinima brand, it was placed under the umbrella of Otter Media. They, they make those OtterBox phone cases, right? They're indestructible. I don't know, they make the Otter Pops with the ice oh, cream. Okay. They, got, they got their hands all over everything. No, they don't make either of those. <laughs> uh, so Machinima was put in the Otter Media box, but Machinima's original content side of things had already become nearly non-existent over the past year. Mm-hmm. Uh, the friends of ours that are, were still there at the end of 2018 were either running various live stream gaming shows or working on DC Daily, the talk show that's featured on the DC Universe app, which is filmed at Machinima Studios and staffed almost entirely by Machinima Studios crew behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, At this point, after some recent layoffs that were also not publicly explained, uh, it seems like for the near future, the only thing going on at Machinima Studios is the DC Daily Show. Uh, Pretty much everyone we know that was not working exclusively on that is currently on the hunt for a new job, uh, which sucks. Yes, but... I mean, I'll say every every person in production that I've ever worked with at that company has done bigger and better things as they yeah. move on. So not worried. I'm not worried about them, but yeah, it is. I mean, they, they all they they're all very talented. They're people. all talented people, and they all will land on their feet. And they all, I think, knew. Yeah, the jig was up. Probably that something was happening. So, yeah. anyways, this brings us to last Friday when thousands of videos, adding up to around 1.5 billion views, vanished in the blink of an eye. For us and for people who followed us here from our old channel, this was very reminiscent of how as soon as we officially left Machinima to start working on this channel full time, all of our old channels pre-2018 videos just disappeared. The reason for this, as explained to us, uh, was that AT&T saw those videos as a potential legal liability. And this has been confirmed also by uh, partners mm-hmm. who were let go before the switch yeah. because any right, any stuff that wasn't previously cleared that was a risk Mm -hmm. Uh, could have brought down an entire company. Uh, Because if your main channel gets as many strikes as your partners have, it all adds up. And there was some weird stuff with like music licensing way back then where there was temporary licenses, but the show still existed. It it was a mess. It was a a mess. Yeah. Uh, Anyways, they they couldn't really vouch vouch that none of the hundreds of old videos of ours hadn't broken any copyright or any laws like that or that the people appearing in them had signed release forms and since those videos were pulling in i don't know just a few dollars a month in ad revenue uh, it would never be worth the parent company's time or money to actually go and fucking handle all of this let's hire a lawyer for fucking 500 dollars an hour to go watch a bunch of five-year-old youtube videos that get like 10 views a month no well, we did, I, I downloaded pretty much everything and backed it up on a hard drive. So it exists somewhere, it's, so that's good. Yeah, anyway. So yeah, they wiped it. Mm-hmm. Now, what happened to the Machinima channel, along with all the remaining videos on our old channel, along with uh, several other channels owned and operated by Machinima, uh, it's the same the same reason. In AT&T's eyes, leaving those videos up is just exposing themselves to unnecessary legal liability, and it would be a big waste of money to try to salvage any of it regardless of whether some corners of the internet consider it history. And regardless of the fact that at any point in the last several years, someone could have sued Machinima over copyright or defamation or release or whatever, if they found examples of it. But they don't want to open themselves up to that uh, extremely slim possibility. Yeah. I mean, I get it, I guess. Luckily, have- there, there's a bunch of subreddits that have da- like backups of it too, and there's already Vimeo uh, playlists popping up and stuff like that. Also, if you're if you're a Patreon or YouTube member, uh, we posted a like 10 minute best of yeah. uh, over on those things. So of the old ETC show stuff. And it, I, it's funny, like the, one of the main reasons why it like sucks that all this stuff's getting taken down is, and like people have been posting a lot of old stuff recently. It's like, my memory, I can't contain all this stuff. I'm watching this stuff as if I'm seeing it for the first time. I'm like, oh man, that's remember we did good that? video. <laughs> that, was like that was me. A lifetime ago. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there was a, a, a just a ton of you, like anything Sark touched on Respawn. I know, Amazing. That, I, it, Respawn Inbox and Respawn Radio, those are the two that I'm most sad about. Yeah. Because that shit was fucking art. Yes. Like, it was so good. Uh, anyways, there's... We're sure that there's way more that goes into this whole privating all the videos thing. 
it's just what we've seen in news and heard from people online and what we've experienced ourselves yeah. trying to explain. We were told by Machinima's lawyers like that this was why this was happening. No. I mean, I'm sure they gave us a very dumbed down explanation yeah. of it, but that's what we were told. Now, it's entirely possible that stuff like Halo Forward Until Dawn or the Happy Hour animated shorts could end up on something like VRV at some point if enough people demand it. But there's basically zero chance that old ETC and Respawn videos are going to get the treatment given how topical they were. The same goes for the vast majority of videos formerly hosted on Machinima's main channel. It's, it's all gone and it sucks, especially for the hundreds of people like us who started our careers there. A big significant chunk of internet hist history is gone as if it never happened. Yeah, it's eerie. And like I even like I knew this day would come, but it's still it's just like, oh man. Yeah, you was, blew it up. It was very rough Friday night being like we I already went through it once when they deleted everything prior to six months. Yeah. And then I went through it again when like everything was gone. Because it affects that the first one kind of just affected us and 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 Kale a bit. But when they wiped everything, it was like, man, it's like almost we went to like a Twitter high school reunion where everyone was, like, came back out of the woodwork and was like, man, this sucks, all together. Yeah, I mean, there was, I mean, our show, the amount of work we put into this is pretty small compared to some of the stuff, like, all your history, I forgot about that. Like, all your history was a history show it about- It was a full-on documentary show It was a full-on full video game documentary series about yeah. the history of video games that a ton of work went into. And, like, that's evergreen content. I hope that, I hope, I hope someday that sees the light of day again. I yeah. highly doubt it will. But there's just stuff like that. that Recknology. VRV needs Machinima Classic as a channel with just like <sighs> the best of. I mean, it's never going to happen. But like, if I was the CEO. Yeah. 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 So that's, I mean, I know it's not a good explanation, but that's It might not why. be the thing that you want to hear either. And, and, and again, we're explaining this from like a production side, not talking about them as an MCN and, and the the bad stuff that happened there or like the history of them as an MCN. We're talking about the shows that were created internally that we got to experience firsthand. It was a very, very special, very magical time of my life that, you know, when you're living it, you don't, it, it, what's the what's the quote? Like, you don't know the, what the best times are when you're living in them. Like, it's only <laughs> like when you look back, you're like, man, I was involved in something Historically yeah. awesome as far as man, this is so goes. cool. And the best part is all these videos are going to be on the internet forever. forever. <laughs> uh, Not so fast, kiddo. Yeah. So, um, well, let's I don't stop know. Crying. Some, someday, like someone needs to write a fucking book about. Not just Machinima, but like the like the weird MCN the digital. MCN like gold rush of like circa two thousand nine, two thousand ten, up to like twenty. 15, 2016, because like, be so people much being, fucking shit happened. We're going to be the people getting interviewed like in the Fire Festival documentary. Yeah, they told like, me yeah, to go, I was there. They told me to go suck a dick, and I was like, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> if, I, if it means we got to get some water on the set, I'll do it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, I'm sure this won't be the last time we, we talk about that. But let's move on. There were a couple other tech stories this week. Uh, let's plow through some of that. Let's start with some Facebook news. Uh, last week, Facebook announced that they had deleted... 364 Facebook pages that were essentially propaganda pages being run by the Russian government and made to look like they were independent news distributors operating out of various places that were not Russia. Facebook says the pages were being run by employees of Sputnik, which is one of Russia's state news agencies that's widely understood to be a propaganda outlet aimed at international audiences. And uh, based on the examples that Facebook provided, the target audiences for this particular batch of propaganda content was actually people living in Russia's neighboring countries like Ukraine, Romania, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Armenia, Georgia, Uz Uzbekistan, and, and so on. It's basically all the former Soviet countries that have... You know what I miss? The Soviet Union. That sort of, uh, I mean, that, I mean, they don't miss the, the communism, but like Russia had a lot of access to like resources and political power and manpower mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union that they don't necessarily have anymore with countries like Ukraine and Georgia being like, no, we're, Europe's over here. We're going <laughs> to, friendship ended with <laughs> yeah. USSR. Europe is my new friend. Yeah. Russia doesn't like that. Now, on the surface, the, the pages presented themselves as normal local pages focused on stuff like weather, sports, and politics. But the subtle goal seems to have been to promote Russian interests and undermine things like the EU and NATO, 
or a country's own anti-Russian sentiment. Uh, a lot of the countries where these pages presented themselves as operating from have elections coming up this year. So it's likely that these pages were gearing up to start pushing harder and harder for pro-Russia candidates and policies while representing themselves as citizens of those countries, which is what Russia has been doing quite a lot of in recent years and have found quite a lot of success it's, in. It's a, it's a dirty playbook, but it works. It wins the game. It's not even if it's not broke, don't fix it. It's if no one's going to break this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's at least nice that this time around people at Facebook were on the lookout and I guess proactively trying to stop it. Yeah, it was also like Facebook was on it, but it was like the FBI apparently sent them. They're like, guys, we've been some of this traffic we've been monitoring. You might want to look at this. And there was uh, some other like nonprofit groups who also like pretty much exist solely to monitor this kind of shit yeah. nowadays. It's well, like, that's uh, that's the, the other thing, too. Is like, if Facebook wasn't a front for what people consider Big Brother before, it definitely is now, now that, like, three years of nothing but going over Facebook with a fine-tooth comb yeah. and, and gathering all this data is done, is if you're still on it, like, that's what it is now. That's what you signed up for. <laughs> you have no excuse. You can't plead ignorance. Yeah. Ironically, though, Facebook themselves got caught recently engaging in a little bit of propaganda and astroturfing. New York Times columnist Kevin Roos noticed last week that despite what seemed like a lukewarm response and limited interest in the Facebook portal, the Amazon reviews for Facebook's answer to Alexa were quite positive. Hmm. All right, well, maybe it's actually a great product that a lot of people want in their homes. I want that camera following me around. We told you not to fucking buy that. <laughs> you didn't listen. Uh, I don't know, maybe, though, if you compare the names of the Amazon users giving those five-star reviews with the names of people on LinkedIn listing themselves as... Facebook employees, you might find a little pattern there. Oh, yeah, it looks like some Facebook employees left some glowing reviews for their own company's product on Amazon to tip the scales using their own names. Why wouldn't they at least try to cover it up? <laughs> so this is like, ugh, I mean, it looks, this is my Amazon account. I've been using it for years. Very real. Looks legitimate. It looks yeah. legit. Uh, but yeah. Why wouldn't you just legally change your name? Uh, yeah, so as noted in Kevin Roos's Twitter thread, uh, this is all against Amazon's rules. Whoops. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also not the best indicator of confidence in how well the product is selling organically. Because no. this is not the kind of thing you do if the product is doing great. In response to that tweet, one of Facebook's VPs was quick to respond, saying that this was not coordinated or directed by the company. And uh, he also said that in an internal memo sent out at launch time, Facebook had in fact specifically told employees not to go around leaving Amazon reviews. I told them not to do that. <laughs> Aw, you, you're telling me they did it. Which like, this, this just means these are a bunch of kiss ass employees. Hey, just boss. like the Amazon ones that are like, everything's great. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Tech co Corporate tech culture is so fucking weird. We're your family. Anyway, whatever the case, whether this was just a couple isolated uh, kiss asses, brown nosers, you know, yeah. breaking the rules to make their product sell better. It, it makes Facebook look stupid regardless. And it does not help their image. But then again, nothing's helping their image nowadays. No. Because they're a bad company. Here's another thing not likely to help Facebook's image. A new app called LOL, LOL <laughs> which is currently in private beta and is basically a meme feed targeted at the young people, specifically teens. Screenshots obtained by TechCrunch show that it's basically Facebook's user interface, but slimmed down to just feature images and videos that are broken down into categories like memes, school, savage, pranks, fails, and wait for it. Anyways, <laughs> TechCrunch's source told them the whole thing is quite cringy. Oh, really? Because taking it at face value. <laughs> seems, oh, it, I don't know. It seemed pretty cool. Seems pretty cringy. Seemed like something the teens would love. We took nine gag and categorized the shit out That's of it. That's literally it's nine gag in a <laughs> in a more fluid interface. Uh, yeah, it apparently it features memes that are sometimes weeks old <laughs> and have most likely already been viewed and shared by teenagers before. You guys heard about this Ugandan knuckles? It's racist, but it's, <laughs> it has its charm. No, you see, I I find the memes and I bring the memes <laughs> to the, to the teenagers. Kids. Well, why don't the teenagers just go get the memes themselves? No, I, I find the memes and I bring them to the teens. Teenagers are too busy with their depression and their math <laughs> homework. They can't be finding <laughs> memes. Uh, anyways, Facebook confirmed that LOL is something they're testing, but it's still just a concept. Although if it's anything like their most recent attempt at getting the teen market back, you know, maybe just give up Facebook. <laughs> their TikTok ripoff lasso 
apparently only got 10,000 downloads in its first 12 days and it's a dead app already. And that speaks a lot also to the fact that their teens don't like Facebook. They're uninstalling at a rapid rate or not installing at all. And th this is this is clearly them trying to get the teenage market back, but no, it's I, not gonna work. And like, again, with like the corporate the when when you get in the corporate structure of these big companies like AT and T or in this case Facebook, like it, this is especially confusing to me because young people still use Instagram a lot, and yeah. Instagram is owned by Facebook. But so that's I don't know in some other building on the campus or maybe I don't I don't even know I don't know how closely the teams work together. But Instagram's doing great with the youth, and yet still over on the Facebook side of things, they're like, guys, we're losing the youth. How are we going to keep the youth? I don't get it. Yeah. Like, you you got them. They're over there. They're over there. Just do Facebook, it over there. Facebook, just accept the fact that your app is for the old people. You know what they need to do? They need to, like, start pitching to, to high school kids, like, hey, you know that boy you like? We can tell you everything about him. Everything he We've likes. We've been data mining the shit out of him and his parents. You want to know his favorite movies? Well, here you go. Sign back up for Facebook. Mm. It's all right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyways, one last thing that we'll cover today before we let you go is the fact that Uber seems to be exploring the idea of taking the concept behind scooter and bike rentals and making the scooters and bikes autonomous. Oh, good. Or at least they might be. This is essentially a rumor based off a tweet by a robotics company CEO saying that Uber had made the announcement at a robotics convention that they were exploring the idea of autonomous scooters and bikes that can drive themselves to charging stations or better locations. Uh, that's, I, you know what? Good. I can't wait to see a bike riding itself. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. This is so dumb. Fine. I, if I, if I <laughs> Look at it go. live in a world where a bike just goes riding by with no one on it, fine. I'm prepared for I this I think world. I've seen a ghost. Yeah. Oh, no, that's You know stupid. what? I'd grab a couple beers, some lawn chairs, and get about mm, half a mile from the charging station and be like, hey, you want to watch the bikes come swarm home I'll tonight? Get a, little, get a lasso. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! It's like when the bats fly out under that bridge in Austin. It's like, oh, oh yeah. it's 7 p.m. The, all the bikes are going to come back and charge themselves. You guys want to go watch all the bikes come back? Uh, but, okay, it sounds like at the very least we're not talking about bikes and scooters that you sit on while doing, they do all the work. That sounds kind of terrifying. Yeah. Wouldn't Because you're shifting your body weight. It can't, like, yeah. it would have to get pretty good at, like, counteracting that. It just seems, yeah, it seems physically difficult. Not going to say impossible, but difficult. Also, you're just reading a book and just yeah. rides you right now into traffic. Like, you, another Mr. Magoo. Vroom, 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 vroom. Now the sensors are working. Yeah. You're not gonna I hit. trust this bike. Now, what's also terrifying, though, is the idea, yeah, the idea of ghost bikes and ghost scooters just riding around unmanned, searching for a charging station or a customer in need. It's very spooky. Yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> also, it's potentially a terrible idea, at least according to a long thread by Eric Paul Dennis. That man has three first names. You can't trust this person. He's going to kill someone. Yeah. No, he's a transportation systems analyst for the Center of Automotive Research. Uh, in his thread, he doesn't deny that this is possible. <laughs> I guess it is. But he points out that the amount of tech that you have to cram inside of a bike or scooter to keep it upright and be able to navigate safely is absurd. You'd need gyroscopes and sensors and GPS and motors and servos and presumably a big strong battery for all that. The bikes and scooters would be heavy and they'd have thousands of dollars in gear attached to them. In other words, very lucrative to thieves. You know, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind <laughs> is fucking dickhead kids, teenagers, just fucking kicking these things oh, over yeah. when they come riding by. Yeah, and they, they would... We've already killed the hitchhiking robot. He lasted like three days in America. Yeah. This is yeah. not going to work here. Yeah, you, they would most likely not be able to get up from being knocked on the ground. And you know, people are going to be kicking these things yeah. over. As soon as they see them, they're going to be chasing them down. So anyway, this thread, he makes he makes a good case for why this is a stupid idea. But big tech companies, they, they're always working on stupid ideas like, like this lull. behind That's the scenes. The meme app. Yeah, they, they've always got like 100 projects going on in secret that are never going to see the light of day, but they're working on them just in case there's some breakthrough and they can say, I patented that. Yeah, mine. Yeah, so I would not count on the ghost bikes and scooters seeing the light of day. Although it would be hilarious. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just so stupid. <laughs> it's just a bunch of bikes and scooters riding themselves. I love the idea of it. I hope it happens. <laughs> I think it's fucking hilarious. Uh, anyways, uh, make sure you go hit up our Patreon or become a member by clicking the join button below. Head over to the Patreon, find out what tier works for you, help us keep the show going. And uh, also, we had uh, Spool 
joined us yesterday. Yeah. Well, we spent two hours mocking terrible inventions like a ghost bike. But yeah. These yeah. inventions actually want more, have want more tech. We spent two hours looking at a bunch of weird Kickstarter trash that solves a bunch of problems that no don't one exist. Has. Yeah. So, uh, uh, check that out and also check out the most recent episode of Weekly Weird News, which is, I think, one of our fucking funniest episodes. It is fantastic. <laughs> Make sure you watch that. It's all about how Michael Cohen is a sexy pit bull. Mm. Shout out to the women for internet today. Yeah, all of them. There's, all, like, there's like 20 accounts now. It's all wild. five dozen women for internet today accounts on Twitter. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye.